Okay, we'll get started. Thank you all for coming out here on this uh, housing day, very busy housing day, very cold housing day. And thanks to all of you joining us from the internet uh, watching this uh, during spring break. Uh, sorry you couldn't be here, but we're happy to have you catching up to right now. Uh, hope, hope you're comfortable in your warm dorm room uh, wherever you're viewing this or in the sands of Florida. Um, so today is, is the third, the final of our three lecture, very quick tour uh, through business, banking, and finance. Um, Lessig gave us in our last lecture uh, a great overview of the financial crisis, its dynamics, and we looked at some of the specific conflicts of interest that characterized um, the impaired ratings of rating agencies like Moody's, um, some of the conflicts of interest that characterized uh, the people who were selling and bundling mortgages in various CDOs and synthetic CDOs and then betting against them on another side. And today what we want to do is, is look at this big picture and step back and ask what other lessons we can draw through an institutional corruption framework for understanding both what went on and how it might be prevented in the future. And this in part involves ascribing blame ascribing responsibility, as well as realizing areas where it's hard to ascribe blame or responsibility, where um, there were honest mistakes or intellectual judgments that it's hard, we can only judge in, in retrospect. In the readings today, you had two which represent the sort of different poles of the spectrum of debates over the nature of the financial crisis. On the one side, you had Charles Ferguson, uh, his Predator Nation book is basically, it's based on his Inside Job documentary. Uh, which is tremendously successful, uh, won many awards. On the other side, you have um, a set of authors from the Boston Fed. And the, uh, the argument from the Boston Fed was that, look, the crisis at its heart was a matter of a classic asset bubble. It's a product of the business cycle. It's a product of irrational exuberance. Uh, people bet on things. They think they're all going up. They all want to be part of this game. Uh, they get over-optimistic. They put a lot of money in, and eventually that bubble bursts, and whoever's left holding uh, the investments is going to lose something. And this is sort of inherent in human nature. It's something that they, they talk about the Dutch tulip crisis uh, of three centuries ago, and they say, look, this boom and bust, uh, irrational exuberance, this is asset bubbles. These are just fundamental to human experience and human uh, economics. It's hard to get away from this. At the other end, Ferguson suggests that, no, there were many things that were predictable there are many things that were understood by insiders, thus the notion of inside job, that there was fraud, deception, various sorts of dishonesty, and some of it he thinks bordering or perhaps actual criminal behavior based on securities law. Um, and at the, at, between these two poles, of this being a, a totally innocuous classic bubble and this being something that was in some sense understood, conspiratorial, and criminal, uh, there's a variety of different positions where people say, well, this might have been understood, Maybe this couldn't, and that's part of the, ch ch the actual challenge of sort of evaluating the crisis uh, in retrospect uh, to say what, what do we think about those things and uh, what do we think could be changed and be different. Um, I want you to watch, this is a very short video that recapitulates many of the things that Lessig told us in the last class, and I want to ask you three questions about this video. Uh, so if you bear with me and, and uh, let's take a look. Or paid their mortgage every month the money system. When a homeowner paid their mortgage every month, the money went to their local lender. And since mortgages took decades to repay, lenders were careful. In the new system, lenders sold the mortgages to investment banks. The investment banks combined thousands of mortgages and other loans, including car loans, student loans, and credit card debt, to create complex derivatives called Collateralized Debt Obligations, or CDOs. The investment banks then sold the CDOs to investors. Now when homeowners paid their mortgages, the money went to investors all over the world. The investment banks paid rating agencies to evaluate the CDOs, and many of them were given a triple A rating, which is the highest possible investment grade. This made CDOs popular with retirement funds which could only purchase highly rated securities. This system was a ticking time bomb. Lenders didn't care anymore about whether a borrower could repay, so they started making riskier loans. The investment banks didn't care either. The more CDOs they sold, the higher their profits. And the rating agencies, which were paid by the investment banks, had no liability if their ratings of CDOs proved wrong. 
There was another ticking time bomb in the financial system. AIG, the world's largest insurance company, was selling huge quantities of derivatives called credit default swaps. For investors who owned CDOs, credit default swaps worked like an insurance policy. An investor who purchased a credit default swap paid AIG a quarterly premium. If the CDO went bad, AIG promised to pay the investor for their losses. But unlike regular insurance, speculators could also buy credit default swaps from AIG in order to bet against CDOs they didn't own. Since credit default swaps were unregulated, AIG didn't have to put aside any money to cover potential losses. Instead, AIG paid its employees huge cash bonuses as soon as contracts were signed. But if the CDOs later went bad, AIG would be on the hook. OK, so three questions about that video. First, how long was it? Anyone want to guess? Four minutes, three minutes. Three minutes. OK, we have a four minute guess, a three minute guess. Two minutes, OK. Boy, time flies, OK. Huh? It might be long enough for the purpose. Uh, it turns it's two minutes and twenty-seven seconds. Um, so right in, yeah, in, which is uh, I think pretty informative for two minutes and twenty-seven seconds. And I note this because at the end of the day, I'm going to talk a little bit about our final projects, in which you can make videos of up to five minutes in length. Um, so one thing you might be thinking about is not only the what you want to deal with in your final project, but how you might choreograph that and express that within a visual media, within a video format. So two minutes and 27 seconds, there's a lot that was communicated there. Um, that's, of course, uh, they have a lot of graphic sophistication. We're not necessarily expecting that of you all, uh, but something to keep in mind. More to the point, um, how happy are you with that explanation? Is there anything you think was missing or perhaps explained in the wrong way? Or do you think it's pretty good? Okay, you're pretty good. I was just curious why the radio listeners are held liable for their names to the school and what that looks like. Yeah. This is just a judgment. Uh, they do, there are, there are ways they could be liable if they left, if there was something enormously materially important that, and there could be lawsuits about due diligence and that and whatnot. Um, but they're, they're just paid for their opinion. And their opinion is an opinion. I think there's, there's some famous, there were some court cases that were settled on this, and uh, there are literally in the, in the depositions things like, you know, this is nothing but our opinion. Um, and it's the nature of financial markets that people's opinions are wrong all the time. And in fact, every, I mean, and this, this comes out a lot in the uh, Goldman Sachs testimony in front of the Senate. Uh, they're saying, how could you sell these things? They, and they say, look, we're market makers. Every time we sell something, it means our opinion is that we'd like to get rid of it at that price. It's somebody else's opinion that they want to buy it at that price. Um, the rating agencies are precisely supposed to be an independent opinion, um, and the question is whether they could be that given the financial incentives they had. Um, but it's very, very difficult to, to actually outline in law what it would mean to make them liable for what is, at the end of the day, their, their opinion, unless they're required to maybe hold some of this on their, I mean, in various ways, and this might be one of the solutions one might explore in the financial crisis, are, is there a way to get the rating agencies to have skin in the game? Do they have to hold some of the securities they rate? Um, can they be liable, and what would that liability look like? Is that one, two? Yeah. As per our discussion last time, the video doesn't mention anything about the government at all, the government's financial policy or how they regulate it. OK, so you don't get a lot of the background institutional conditions. Um, what, are, what are the loan guarantees the government's providing? What are the subsidies where Fannie Mae, or Sally Mae and Freddie Mac and that sort of thing? Um, so you're, you're lacking some of the institutional background. I agree. Okay, excellent. Okay. Okay, and they don't talk about uh, the synthetic nature of CDOs, and they, they're, there's some more complex they could say, things they could say about derivatives. All in all, not a, not a bad for two minutes and 27 seconds, I think. Um, and it ends with AIG. And AIG, if uh, you recall the last lecture, AIG was the biggest of all the bailouts, and it was the bailouts that had infuriated the Tea Party. Uh, they didn't want to be left bailing out the losers. Um, and we have a sort of a run-up in that video as to why it was that AIG was in trouble. They had made all these credit default swaps. They had made all this insurance. 
Uh, they didn't have the collateral to back it up when those went sour, and um, so they ended up in a, uh, in a position where they, they couldn't cover their, uh, their actual liabilities. Um, so what judgment should we make of the government's decision to rescue AIG? Uh, I realize it's a very complex thing, but um, well, first of all, what, what, it, what was AIG's initial bailout? What did they get? Remember the number? Yeah. It's 85, 85 billion in the initial um, bailout. And then by, the, by 2012, the final number was 182 billion. And what was the argument for bailing out AIG? So the argument, yeah, it has these contagion effects that uh, were AIG to go under, that this is going to hurt everybody else. And so it's a social calculus. Um, even though you might be upset with what they did, the situation they're in, it makes more sense overall um, for social welfare to try to bail out this company to prevent a further deepening of the financial crisis. Um, so how many people are on board with that? You think this is a good explanation and a good justification? Um, given what little we know about uh, from the readings and whatnot, that is, this is a good idea. Yep. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to argue with him? Okay. You don't want to. So you, you want to address this. What does this mean for the future problem? Um, I think if I was going based off the information like that was presented off that video, I would mm -hmm. say it was kind of like the government was rewarding mismanagement uh, of funds, especially like after there were many, so many, so many contracts signed. Like AIG was giving huge bonuses to like people who were <coughs> uh, making such risky moves, um, and then not setting aside money afterwards. If I were to go just on that information, like I can, I could definitely see how the Tea Party would think to have that. And it sounds like you're raising two things. One is you're you're rewarding bad behavior that was or past behavior that was bad, and maybe and you're also suggesting you might not be monitoring how these new funds are spent. So maybe they're going to more bonuses that you think are illegitimate. And so I have one, two. Yep. So they bit, yes. Okay, I think that like where it got very sketchy was because then when AIG got bailed out, then a lot of other companies such as Lehman Brothers were like, why not me too? I'm pretty big too, and I bailed out. So, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. so you bring out a point. So AIG ends up paying back um, about 202 billion. This is debated. It depends on uh, a lot of questions about the cost of capital, about um, how you calculate some, some stock accounting or whatnot. But the claim is that the government made something like uh, uh, 27, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, 22.7 billion. Um, yeah, that's about right. Yes. Something in that neighborhood. The numbers are disputed. So we had a. Yeah. So a big, a big question about the future incentives. So the moral hazard problem, the what, is this, what does this bind us to for the future that could provide, pr prove disastrous um, in terms of the way the economy becomes managed going forward? Uh, who, was, who was the biggest beneficiary of this initial bailout beyond AIG? What did they do with the 85 billion? The creditors. Who's the major holder of? $14 billion worth of credit default swaps that AIG has to now pay. Yep, okay, so uh, 14 of this immediately goes to Goldman that gets par value. Uh, 
on their credit default swaps. There's some debate as to whether you might have negotiated what's called a haircut on that, whether they might have been paid uh, less than par value, maybe 60 cents on the dollar. Um, but again, these are, these are decisions that have to be made in the course of a day sometimes. They need to be made very quickly. It's easy to second guess them going back. Um, so as an overall judgment, let's see. Those who are in favor of the bailout, you could just raise your hand. Those who think it made sense, uh, OK. And those who are against the bailout, you think it was probably it sets a uh, difficult precedent for the future. OK. Good, good. So that's, this is our judgment of that. Um, I wanted to ask, actually, as a way of transition, I had, I had an ethical dilemma that I just recently faced. And uh, there might be a distant, uh, distant analogy to the uh, AIG case. Uh, the dilemma actually started last night. So um, I really, really meant to prepare for a lecture today, but I have some conferences coming up. And you know, all of a sudden, it was 10 PM. I hadn't even begun to think about this lecture. And I thought I could show videos all day long. And, um, but I would really be shortchanging you all, because you're, all, you know, you're paying tuition. This is a, uh, an important lecture. Um, so I did what I think was the right thing. I stayed up all night long. Stayed up till 7 a.m. preparing a presentation. Uh, went to bed, just slept a few hours, got up 45 minutes ago, jumped in the shower, ran over here. But on my way here, there was one thing I knew I needed to make this lecture a success. Um, and that was my favorite source of caffeine, a, a big can of Red Bull. So uh, just like 20 minutes ago, I, I pull into CVS as I'm walking over here, uh, still very, very tired, and go in, grab the bottle or grab the can of Red Bull get in line, I'm waiting there, thinking finally I'm going to pull this all off, we're going to get a great lecture, I'm going to be alert. And as I'm standing in line, I realize I forgot my wallet. And so there I am thinking, this is bad. Uh, I really need this Red Bull. It's going to be for your all benefit. Um, and I look around, I realize I know exactly where the security cameras are. There's only one clerk there. <laughs> and it really wouldn't be hard for me to just stick this in my backpack and walk on out. In fact, I'm a smart person. Uh, I'm sure I could take this bottle, this can of Red Bull. This is not going to be a problem for me. Um, should I steal the Red Bull? You're shaking your head, no? No. OK. Why not? Oh, uh, OK. You're, you're, you're a, a legal stickler. OK. Uh, anyone want to argue that I, sh I should? St OK. In terms of economics, the value of a can of Red Bull at CVS is probably a lot less than the value of the $3, yeah. To, uh, what, 50 or so of us. <laughs> uh, plus some untold number of thousands on that X. How much do you all pay to go? What's, what's tuition? $40,000. dollars in order of like a couple hundred per lecture. So. Probably, yeah, yeah. 20000 divided by two, 20000 You're taking four classes, 5000 a class. We have 30 lectures, 15 sections. Yeah, it's around four, $100 a lecture, basically, you're all paying. So say 100 people show up, that's $10,000. So there's $10,000 of value right here in this room. You all are paying $10,000 to be here, and you want me to hold that up for $3? $3 for Red Bulls? Clearly, the social calculus is that we would all be better off, the society would be better off if CVS loses $3. Yeah, so we're externalizing the costs on this innocent third party. On the other hand, because of my initial bad planning, I was going to externalize the cost on this innocent third party. So there's two innocent third parties. Um, I agree CVS is not going to like this. And it raises a actually profound moral question about whether anyone is in a position to impose this cost on them to help benefit a larger group. Um, a serious moral, I saw another hand up here. Uh, yeah. It's my fault. I mean, it was AIG's fault that they made these stupid credit default swaps. Um, but the good of our society depends on this decision now that has to be made after the bad behavior. So, I oh, yeah. I guarantee it would be better with Red Bull. <laughs> <laughs> so what about two Red Bulls? Like, uh, oh, it's a, a decreasing marginal uh, <laughs> utility. 
So it, it peaks really bad, like two thirds of a can of Red Bull is, is the optimized, <laughs> optimized point. I know this, I have Lily and then, right. Check that next time. That's a good idea. Uh, <laughs> but you rate, yeah. So you raise this, this profound question of what, what are the expectations and precedents in this sense? Uh, does this mean next time I do the lecture, uh, I think to myself, you know, I think I'll forget my wallet today. Uh, maybe I don't need to, you know, plan as effectively because I know I can always, as long as the calculation works out, um, you know, I can err on this side and be a little lax on that. Uh, so there is this big question, again, of moral hazard of what, what the future and what are the incentives going forward, uh, even though this one decision might be on the, the benefit of the society at large. I had two more comments. Yeah. One. Huh. <laughs> well, what, you know, what, I mean, what, what do you think about the quality of the lecture so far? Did, can you tell? <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get back to that. I had one and two. Yeah. Is there a comment up here? No. Okay. That would be great, uh, but they won't do that. I, I, uh, I'm pretty sure that the lady behind the counter, I thought about this um, uh, because, you know, I could just come back uh, the next day and say that here's three bucks. I took three bucks from you all and I'm sorry, but it was necessary. And I could reason with them and say, I'm paying you back four bucks. So it was worth your while. And I guarantee you CVS isn't going to do that. They're going to file a suit against me and they're going to be upset. I agree, that would have been a good idea. That would have been an economically rational arrangement, but other legal and social constraints prohibit us from doing that. I think at the same time, another factor is that you're incurring a risk when you're stealing the Red Bull. For example, you think you know where the security cameras are, but what happens when they have an undercover agent that happens to be telling you? <laughs> yeah, that's a risk I was willing to take. Um, what the, I, I think it, it's a strained analogy to AIG. Um, but it raises a larger, larger question of how we adjudicate social cost to an economic system as a whole and the specific incentives that actors within those systems face. I, I wanted to briefly mention there's a, a classic paper written in 1994 by uh, Akerlof and Romer. Akerlof went on to win the Nobel Prize. Um, Romer, I think, is one of the uh, candidates for the Nobel Prize in, uh, for many years going forward today. And they observed, um, this is, they're writing in this 94, and they said, during the 80s, you have all these bubbles that bust. A um, number of unusual financial crises occurred in Chile, in the United States, in Dallas, Texas, in the junk bond market. And you know, one perspective would be the economic perspective. These are just bubbles. They're classic bubbles, and they're inherent to uh, human nature. Um, but they had a theory for why these actual bubbles happened. They, she, they thought they didn't have to happen, but they were encouraged because of the backdrop of uh, legal institutions and economic incentives. Um, and their theory was that an economic underground might come to life if a firm has an incentive to go broke for profit at society's expense, what they call looting, rather than to go for broke, that is, to gamble on success. And they talked about this concept of bankruptcy for profit uh, that can occur if you have poor accounting, lax regulation, low penalties for abuse, which gives owners an incentive to pay themselves more than their firms are worth and then default on their debt obligations. Um, so they worked through a model on this. Uh, and the, the intuition behind this um, is that you have various ways in which you can guarantee get debt. That is, various ways in which people can get loans that might go beyond what they were normally able to get. That is, so they're going to have more money available to them. Um, and 
often there are conditions on these sort of uh, guarantees, and you try to have various sorts of uh, ways of accounting for these assets. Um, but bankruptcy for profit, profit will happen when you have uh, a strategy where you can make more money by defaulting on these loans uh, and getting them through various sort of um, regulatory or uh, you know, social mismanagement. So they, they conclude in the opening pages here um, that once owners have decided they can extract more from a firm by maximizing their present take, any action that allows them to extract more currently will be attractive, even if it causes a large reduction in the true economic net worth of the firm. A dollar increased in dividends today is worth a dollar to owners, but a dollar increased in future earnings of the firm is worth nothing because future payments accrue to the creditors who we left holding the bag. As a result, bankruptcy for profit can cause social losses that dwarf the transfers from creditors <clears throat> that the shareholders can induce. Because of the disparity between what owners can capture and the losses they create, we refer, bankruptcy, we refer to bankruptcy for profit as looting. So the idea is you might have a system in which um, uh, regulatory guarantees, bankruptcy law, actually makes current owners pay themselves an enormous amount of money. If the firm goes bust, then um, you know, if the people have already gotten the money and society is left uh, with the bill. Now, in a comment on this piece, uh, and this sort of explains some of the uh, anxiety over the, the latest wave of bailouts, um, Greg Menkew, back in 94, he must have been uh, a lot younger then, uh, pointed out that they set this up in this paper as an opposition. That you know, either you loot um, and you have the strategy to loot, or you, you know, invest in the firm's success by taking on risky entrepreneurial things. And Mickey says, hold on, these strategies might look really similar. So you might take really, really, really risky investments on that are going to pay enormous amounts. And it turns out, if they fail, there are some guarantees that you can fall back on. So rather than set this up as an opposition, that either your conspiracy, you know, either you begin with this you know, terribly malfeasant intention of bankruptcy for profit, he's saying, no, no, bankruptcy for profit could be closely aligned with firms pushing the envelope and pursuing profits. Um, and essentially, this could be construed as what happens uh, at the end of an element of the asset bubbles in the 80s and what some people think happens uh, in the course of the, bank, the bailout of many banks uh, at the, in the end of the financial crisis. Um, the one thing we didn't focus on uh, so far, and I think it's essential to understanding this, and it also might give us a tool or a lever for, lever for thinking about conflicts of interest, um, is how Asset bubbles are driven, in the, particularly in this last case, not simply because of investing my own capital, but the way in which capital had been leveraged, and our banking system had encouraged that in various ways. So this is a, also a very short video. Um, Here's how it works. In a normal deal, someone with $10,000 buys a box for $10,000. He then sells it to someone else for $11,000. For a $1,000 profit, a good deal. But using leverage, someone with $10,000 would go borrow $990,000 more dollars, giving him $1 million in hand. Then he goes and buys 100 boxes with his $1 million and sells them to someone else for $1,100,000. Then he pays back his $990,000 plus $10,000 in interest. And after his initial $10,000, he's left with a $90,000 profit versus the other guy's $1,000. Leverage turns good deals into great. Into great deals. So this is I mean, it's a very simple explanation of how leverage works, right? You, you take some money, you use that as collateral to get a much larger loan, you then go do something with that loan, you make a deal with it, and you take the profits to pay back the enormous amount of money you borrowed, uh, and then you, you get the, the, the remainder. Now, the whole way that works is you really need to be assured this is a good deal, and um, the whole risk calculation that goes into that is that your lender is only going to give you that money if they think the deal has a certain chance of success and you can cover uh, and you have various sorts of guarantees for collateral to cover if something goes over. Now, of course, if those boxes decline in value by 50% once you've borrowed or once you've bought them, suddenly you're, you're, out, you're on the books for a, a million dollar loan and you have a $500,000 asset and all of a sudden you who began with $10,000 now owe 
five hundred thousand dollars. So you're, uh, you can see how you can very quickly get into trouble. And part of what happens in the CDO market is all the banks on Wall Street are extremely leveraged. Most of them leverage around ten to one, um, so that when housing prices decline, not only does that bank uh, become in a lot of trouble, but everybody who lend lend to that bank. Um, now the bank doesn't have the collateral and the cash to pay them back. And this ends up with a, a profound credit crisis, which means you get contagion across a lot of different economic sectors. And this is essential to understanding why it was that Greenspan and others, in their own accounts, didn't understand the magnitude of the crisis. And one thing I want you to, I mean, one thing we should be asking ourselves at this point for each of these sort of further vignettes is how reasonable is it? that they missed this, that they misunderstood this, that they did the wrong thing, that they took the wrong approach, that they made the wrong judgment. Uh, was this a reasonable judgment, or, they sh or should they have known better? Um, and how might interests of various sorts have biased these judgments? Um, let's see if I can get to the Greenspan thing without CNBC charging me for a, OK. Always understood that there's a lot, lot of irrational exuberance and fear and all of those various aspects of human nature affecting the GDP and the market and everything else. But we all assumed, as in fact it's almost general, that those were random and that they would essentially wash out. And therefore you could set up your econometric models or any model you want uh, looking only at the effects of people acting rationally in their long-term self-interest. And that was a general proposition. That was what they were teaching in the universities, and that's basically what uh, economics was all about, going all the way back into the last two centuries ago. Uh, we missed the timing badly on September the 15th, 2008. All of us knew that there was a bubble, but a bubble in and of itself doesn't give you a crisis. In the dot-com crisis, so to speak, uh, the stock market collapsed, asset prices collapsed, there were huge losses, you can barely see it in the GDP. Uh, and a date I will always remember, October the 19th, 1987, the Dow went down 22% in one day, by far the record of all, all time. I had thought we were going to run into all sorts of problems. Nothing happened. Now, to be sure, it was touch and go for a while, and the Fed opened up the spigots, but you can't see it in the GDP figure. So bubbles, per se, are not what the issue is. It's turning out to be bubbles with leverage. And l leverage is critically important, obviously, because it's the only way you can get the issue of contagion going with the problems that arose. But uh, the bottom line is this. I said to myself when I saw what happened on September the 15th that there's something fundamentally wrong with the way I and a lot of my colleagues look at the economy. And so I tried to go on what looked so much like to me like a detective story, trying to unwind layer by layer. And the first layer I try to unwind was the fundamental premise of everyone looking out for their own long-term self-interest. Okay, so that's Greenspan's retrospective, uh, trying to understand what he missed. One thing he calls attention to is... Before Mike could see his banking uh, and investing on one page, well, we got he opened the, uh, a Merrill Lynch investment account and... Merrill Lynch, you can't get away from them. Uh, Okay, so uh, Lessig had a number of people in the dock last time. Uh, we can ask of each of these uh, in what sense they failed, how could they have known better, what were the incentives they faced, and how might both those incentives or their way of thinking about things. Greenspan says his fundamental assumptions about how people act needed to be reevaluated. Um, if we put Greenspan in the dock for a moment, you know, with, along with Bernanke, who came after him, um, I think we can say you know, they made fundamental intellectual errors. Uh, this is a famous speech called The Great Moderation, given in 2004, uh, two years before Bernanke becomes the Fed chairman. 
um, where he notes the most striking feature of the economic landscape for the past 20 years or so has been a substantial decline in macroeconomic volatility. Um, and this, this is the great moderation, a period in which there hasn't been enormous ups and downs, enormous booms and busts. And he goes on to say there are three explanations he'll call structural change, improved macroeconomic policies, and good luck. He gives, in the course of this talk, a, a large argument for why structural changes and macroeconomic policies were responsible. And in retrospect, it turns out it was probably a healthy dose of good luck as well. Um, but even for him, he thought that there was an increased depth and sophistication of financial markets that were leading to stability. Uh, so this is an argument for uh, you know, the financial complexities that leading to more stability. Um, this is what Greenspan was talking about and thinking about the nature of bubbles before. Uh, if you look at all the sort of major economic uh, I should say major financial crises that were not necessarily economic crises. Volcker's tightening, uh, the stock crash in 87, uh, the SNL crisis, the dot-com crash, these didn't tremendously affect GDP. Uh, but when you get here to the, uh, the latest financial crisis, there is actually a huge downturn, also reflected particularly in private domestic investment, partly because of this enormous credit crunch. So these things, uh, the, the economy weathers, uh, but th there's something different this time. And the leverage is key to Greenspan's explanation for that. So he, as many other, I mean, people were aware that there was a housing bubble. Uh, this was a, a version of the Schiller Index that uh, Lessig showed us uh, last time. Um, but the argument was that this could be contained, that whoever was betting on it, their losses could be contained to them. Uh, so if you had skin in the game, if you were making bets on either side of this, you're consenting adult, you know what you're doing, and the losses will be, or gains will be yours. The problem was, and just to compare, uh, if you look at the dot-com versus the housing bubble, what happened in the stock market looks very similar. Um, and here we had no general economic crisis, and here we have a massive one. And this is particularly driven by the credit crunch. So you have, because of all this leverage, um, the inability to get funding and a lot of banks becoming insolvent, uh, as well as AIG and, and other various financial institutions. This is where uh, AIG and Lehman happened right at uh, September there. Uh, this is a LIBOR rate on the internet bank loans. And it basically, it basically becomes in, in, impossible to get access to money. The entire economy grabs to the halt if you depend on any sort of uh, financing at that point uh, in 2008. So that's the sort of macroeconomic story. And we can say, I think, in retrospect, that the central bank failed to understand, and as an intellectual matter, they failed to understand the systemic risk the degree of leverage that many institutions had. Remember, if you had, if you were, lever if basically you had a lot of obligations by um, derivatives, though you don't need to necessarily have collateral for those, um, and various contagion effects. So one thing you can ask yourself is, are these just intellectual errors, or should central bankers have been able to know better? And what, what were the intellectual blinders, if you think that was the case, that kept them from thinking in you know, broader terms? Let's also think about regulators. How did regulators fail? Um, one thing we should note about regulation of financial authorities is that they're very diverse. Um, there's a number of sometimes overlapping regulatory agencies that have different jurisdictions. Um, this outlines some of the, the major ones. Uh, this means that in practice, uh, it can be very complex uh, because you have, this is just looking at how uh, Der a derivative trade might interact with all these different regula regulatory agencies, uh, both within a bank, on a derivatives market. Um, you have the Federal Reserve, the SEC, FDIC, CFTC, all these agencies involved in different ways. Sometimes these agencies don't always get along. Uh, so as an institutional matter, we might think about, are there better ways that these agencies themselves could be structured? Were they deprived of various sorts of funding and resources they needed? Um, that could be one level of analysis uh, institutionally here. Um, Another level of analysis could be for the specific requirements they made. Clearly, we find out in retrospect that capital adequacy wasn't there for a number of uh, financial institutions, um, various conflicts of interest rules. There was just a ruling three days ago the Wall Street Journal reported on a big ruling in uh, Delaware that had a company, a, one of the very large banks, had made a deal where they were on both sides. They were representing a buyer and a seller, and they didn't disclose on both sides that they were doing that. And the Delaware court just ruled uh, that they're actually liable for various sorts of conflicts of interest violations um, that has a lot of the M&A deals sort of being rethought right now. Uh, and it, it raises the big question about what conflicts of interest should be tolerated. 
Um, so this is another area of institutional analysis. What were the specific uh, foci that were either neglected uh, or underappreciated? Um, another dimension, though, is what is described in the literature as regulatory capture. And we're going to see this next week in medicine. We're going to see this further down the line in the various other situations. Um, Zingales gives a description of this. And the idea is that if you're a regulator in a federal agency, who are the people you depend most on? The people you regulate. They have the information. It's very technical fields. So you're constantly in contact with them. What else do they have in addition to information? They have money. So if you need to organize a meeting, chances are they can either help host it or they can put on a conference. So they're going to have a lot of resources for just doing things. What else money related, though? You're the only people that care. I mean, if you're doing complex, complex EPA <laughs> regulatory stuff on these chemicals of certain amounts, it, the only audience are the hundred or so firms that deal with that chemical. Uh, jobs. So jobs. If you anybody worked in the federal government, spent a summer in an agency. A few years ago, I worked in a federal regulatory agency for summer. It was uh, it was a very academic environment. It was kind of nice, but they don't pay well and a lot of people talk about cashing out. So if you're for 10 years a guy who figures out how a certain chemical is going to be regulated, um, you're the most valuable person in the world for an industry, industrial firm to hire who then needs to comply with that sort of regulation. Um, so you're going to be in a few years perhaps working on the other side and vice versa if you want a, a break from the uh, very stressful life of a uh, high corporate executive. You might take some time off, spend some time in government, help craft and see through some new regulations. Um, so various ways in which you might think of regulata regulators themselves as being compromised by their dependency on those who they regulate. Uh, one other, I mean, particular form this takes uh, is this revolving door. So there is a sort of just an outline in the course of the financial crisis. Here often at the outside you see various sort of government agencies, people who were, you know, working in high positions in the Treasury. Um, or in state government who were then going back to corporate positions in banks, uh, Fannie Mae, AIG, Goldman Sachs, countrywide. Um, so you have the, the very same principles, the very same leaders, decision makers, who are on, sometimes sitting in the regulatory chair are going to be in a matter of years, sometimes months, on the corporate side and then maybe coming back and forth. So this also could create various sorts of conflicts of interest that we think are institutionally problematic in having the independence of judgment that are necessary. Um, we might speculate for a moment what a good policy would be. I, just to give you an example, so this is a recent list of 29 people, uh, uh, about a third of them are from Harvard, um, who have gone back and forth between the, some of the highest positions in government um, and the highest regulatory agencies. and. Uh, I think there's a strong argument that this might be necessary given the kind of expertise that's demanded. But there's, it also raises the question of whether we can put some sort of rules or laws that might help insulate us from the conflicts of interest that arise. Anyone want to propose any regulatory, any policies that might um, be appropriate to think about dealing with the, regula with the uh, revolving door? So one idea would be this so-called cooling off. So that if I write the regulation this year in this agency, that means I can't two months later go sit and oversee its implementation. I might need to have a year or two before I can enter the industry again to at least um, undo some of the immediate link between those two things. So cooling off periods, they have a version of this right now with um, congressional staffers and lobbyists. Um, and one question is whether this might be extended to regulatory type revolving door things. Anyone want to ban this? No, oh, no, go ahead. So you want to tell people what they can make? If they can, uh, so a salary cap of some sort um, on that revolving door. 
Any other proposals? Okay. Some. Oh. Yeah. So you, yeah, so the thought is that are these people all rich anyway? Some of them, or so maybe, uh, uh, yeah, maybe you finesse that in a way where they they have less immediate financial interest. So maybe they can advise during the cooling off period, but can't actually be employed. One could imagine writing a contract though that says, "I will advise you for the next two years, and at the end of that advising, you can pay me the lump sum that I would have been due had I been working with you." Um, uh, but various ways, yeah. So various ways you might think of trying to separate this. I think it's a tough problem. Um, two other things I should mention here. Uh, FIRE, F-I-R-E, that's financial insurance and real estate. These look at the contributions uh, that donors above $10,000 level make. And as you notice, I mean, all, you know, donating to political campaigns is perfectly legal and something that many people from different industries do. Lobbyists, healthcare, communications, law, these are all enormous industries with a lot of money and, you know, they've increased their donations. but. By and large, the you know, most enormous of all these have come from the finance area. Uh, so this raises another question about independence of judgment and what might be done about that. We're going to think some more about that in the political context uh, going forward. Um, I should mention not that was political campaign donations. This is lobbying expenditures. Uh, these might also influence the regulatory capacity of those that oversee financial institutions. And one thing lobby, lobbying we know buys is actually access access to the agencies, uh, access to various sorts of members. So if you compare various sorts of com consumer protection groups to uh, commercial banks, you know, obviously, and I don't, this isn't necessarily surprising, but there's a question of you know, whether it creates an imbalance that we might do anything or want to do anything about. <clears throat> so we talked a lot last section about the conflicts of interest that arise more imminently within banks. Uh, Charlie Ferguson talks uh, also in exquisite detail in our readings about uh, some of those. I'm not going to dwell on those right now, but the, I think for each of those, you might again ask yourself, are these honest intellectual mistakes? Are they intolerable conflicts of interest? And what can we do about them? The uh, Mr. Lee's Gaussian copula formula, uh, you might think that was an honest mistake. There's a lot of people who are criticizing it, mostly from outside the banking community leading up to the crisis. Um, but again, who should have known better and what should have been done about it on the ground then and there? But finally today, we want to discuss the one group we haven't talked a lot about, except obliquely uh, in terms of Bernanke and uh, Greenspan, and that's economists themselves. Because we understand bankers are in the midst of a real business here, that they have immediate interest they're responding to, that there's money to be made. Um, we understand regulator regulators have all sorts of also competing interests on their time. They have the industries that are lobbying them. They have members of Congress. They have regulatory mandates. But the one group that's supposed to be the most intellectually independent, the most objective, that who stands outside of the system, that has tenure in their own positions of scholarship and looks in and studies these things, and they're supposed to think about the larger social good, the larger social welfare, the costs and benefits from society as a whole, that's economists. And so how did they fare and what should our judgment about them be? Um, Luigi Zingales begins his little piece uh, noting that Queen Elizabeth asked at a conference shortly after the financial crisis started, why did nobody notice it? And that this sort of um, was an embarrassing question for the economists at the London School of Economics assembled to hear it uh, because uh, in Zagalis' own terms, some people were writing on it, but nobody really had focused on it in the way that they might have uh, and perhaps should have in retrospect. And what Zingales raises in this, um, the two pieces that you read by him, one's a little bit more in-depth, one a little bit more popular, is he asks, how is it that economist judgment could be biased? And what he proposes is, in the first instance, not that economists are bad people and that, they're, that they, don't, they don't play into Charlie Ferguson's account of sort of deliberate conspiratorial uh, designs. Um, and he doesn't even think they're terribly greedy people that are responding to kind of perverse, um, you know, big financial incentives. But nonetheless, he thinks there is evidence that they uh, toe the line in different ways, in ways that could actually compromise uh, serious their, their intellectual uh, judgment and ability to think outside the box. And he phrases this initially in a way that should be very congenial to economists, right? Because economists, if they believe one thing, it's that we all respond to incentives. 
And if economists constantly call our attention to the way in which regulators can be captured, he asked, why couldn't economists sometimes be captured as well? Defend the interests of business over free and competitive markets that he thinks the economic theory actually, at the end of the day, uh, should justify. And he'll also note that he spent his life amongst economists. And he can testify they're honest people. They have a passion for research. They've actually accepted lower salaries to do this. Um, but despite all this, uh, his claim is that that doesn't protect them from biases. So the question is, how do these biases come in? So what's his account of that? What are, what are the sources of potential bias for economists in his view? How, do they, how might they fail to be objective, as, objective and out of the box thinkers? There must be some economists in the room. So one question about data sources, particularly for business economists, that uh, I've had this experience myself. You, need, you approach some business and say, hey, I'm studying X, Y, or Z. I'd really love to get your data. And the business says, first of all, what do you want to prove? What do you want to show? Is it going to hurt my business? Why would I give you access to my business if it's going to hurt it? And so yes, I'll give you the data. I'm going to have a contract, though, that says I get to veto any results that come out if I don't like them. Um, or at minimum, I'm only going to keep giving you information so long as I'm sure this is going my way. So one, one bias would be from business access, from the data access that a lot of business studies require. Um, what is actually published in journals is considered by experts? So there's this question of publication bias. That uh, There are many gatekeepers to final publication in top journals. Um, and one of those major roadblocks are the editors themselves. So editors get to assign uh, reviewers. And editors usually have a pretty good idea of where, what reviewers think about different things. If they like, if the editor likes a paper, they can definitely put it to very positive reviewers who hew the same line. If the editor doesn't like a paper, they can kill it by sending it to very curmudgeonly reviewers. Um, and he contrasts this with the way a lot of law reviews are run, um, as well as there's a few other uh, subfields uh, of other disciplines. Um, but editors have an enormous amount of control. They're gatekeepers for the discipline as a whole. So if you run afoul of a few of the top editors, there's a chance your ideas may never see the light of day. Yeah, and I think this is a great point, and it's something that, ironically, economists might be ill-equipped to understand or explain, but Zingala says, look, there is a lot of just groupthink. We know this from sociology. Um, there's ways of thinking about the world. They uh, encompass everything from explicit ideology to just wanting to be part of the group, and th people are enormously invested. Their identity is invested in this. Their, uh, their entire worldviews are invested in this, and they're very slow to change. So you might think of analogies with philosophy of science, uh, Kuhn, and scientific revolutions, and the ways in which certain paradigms, certain ideologies, um, you know, on various sorts of the sides of the political spectrum might take hold of people and are very intransigent, in, and it's very difficult to think outside that box. Uh, so we have three, oh, was that a, yeah. oh, just stretch, oh, just, okay. Uh, So consulting contracts. Uh, consulting can be actually very lucrative. We've had a few, uh, I think Max and Max Bazerman and Mal Salter both in here. They've spent a lot of time consulting on the side. Um, and, this, and Max was very careful to try to think about the ways in which that might bias his opinion. He talked about giving proceeds in certain companies to charity. Uh, he also was involved with some depositions, a very legal testimony. Um, so this might also bias. Anything else? That, Right. Yeah, and in some ways, I think you're right. There, there's a sense of at least they have skin in the game. So at least when they have a financial theory, 
their own money or money they manage and have strong interest in is at stake. And that might actually make us to, to have a little more credence about what they're saying. Um, but that could also create you know, various forms of groupthink as well. Um, so I think you know, all, these, all these sources are things that Zingales sort of outlines, lays out. Um, uh, and something you should notice about this list is that it's not just economists that have this. So um, probably people in the English department don't have as many of these conflicts. Uh, but people in, in political science and various sorts of bus other business school departments, management, marketing, um, there are various, well, maybe some law faculty, there are various ways this might influence a lot of disciplines. And we're going to think down the road a little bit uh, when we come to universities, we're going to think about the production of knowledge and the way in which knowledge becomes uh, understood, spread, and disseminated. Thinking about think tanks and their independence, thinking about universities uh, and their independence down the line. And you we're gonna, might want to keep these ideas um, in the back of your head when we get to those as well. Uh, finally, Zingales gives a, uh, a sort of cautionary tale about the nature of expertise in general. And this is sort of a larger social commentary that he, he observes that our society is increasingly complex. We depend in so many ways on people that have very localized, specialized expert knowledge. And that means that these people are in a position of power over us. There, there are sometimes very small groups of people that understand these complex things. And we need to trust them in some degree and hope that they have the kind of either internal debate, healthy debate, to keep themselves honest, or various sorts of external measures um, that can also bring them to account. Uh, otherwise, I think he also cautions about this classic concern that every conspiracy, or pardon me, every profession might be a conspiracy against the laity. Um, he gives a few empirical examples of this. I th you know, you can judge whether or not you find these compelling. Uh, he looks at those uh, economic experts who serve on corporate boards, finds that they're much more, surprise, surprise, um, supportive of high executive compensation. Um, he also finds that those sorts of people uh, take more uh, pro-management views and various sorts of um, uh, executive decision-making questions in business. Uh, this could be a matter of selection. It's hard to tell the, where causality runs. But at first glance, there seems to be some evidence in what Zingal is, uh, presents out there. He does some other statistical studies of um, people's views on uh, large compensation for management. So at the end of his little analysis here, and you might think of his analysis as a kind of interesting case study for you as you think about your own analyses of institutional corruption, whatever projects you do. He sets up this situation. He says, look, there's a problem. There seemed to be a lack of independent judgment in aspects of the financial crisis. Um, here's one way in which this one group we call economists, who are generally presumed to be sort of independent, might have their actual judgments corrupted. I'm going to list for you areas in which, or you know, let me give you an account of how they might be corrupted. It's plausible. I'm going to suggest some evidence. And finally, in light of this, I'm going to propose some remedies, some ways of addressing this. Um, of course, his is a bit more elaborate and more in-depth than we're asking of you. Um, but as a general framework, I think he, you know, this can be an example. And what he ends with, and this is a, a series of proposals, um, he suggests this reform of a publication process. Uh, he wants journals themselves to be able to compete against, uh, with uh, submissions, restricting outside activities of editors, uh, thinking about different data policies that can uh, allow people to access data in less biased ways, and various ways of shaming academics uh, who take part in testimony in ways that are manifestly uh, contrary to other positions they've taken or they, that he thinks experts could actually call them out on. Um, and finally, though, he wants to raise awareness amongst economists that they themselves can be biased, and at least perhaps that awareness can make them more cautious in, in the way they behave. Um, any, uh, any thoughts on this list? Things you think are either silly, uh, overdone, inadequate, that you might add to it? So there are the, what generally happens is the actual lawyers involved will try very hard to get experts to um, contradict, you know, contradict the other side to give a different perspective. Um, his claim is that the, that the best community equipped to actually uncover dubious expert testimony would be economists themselves, but right now they take very little interest in that. It's all, it's all very much siloed off. So his, his argument here is to extend what's kind of done through adversarial litigation right now to include, to basically have more of a, sh a spotlight shine from the economic community on, you know, so that you, you run up a flagpole, hey, do you know, um, you know, your favorite economist is giving a testimony in this case, billions of dollars at stake, 
uh, hey, all you other economists here, what do you think of his position? Let's get some uh, sort of commentary that's not being paid either for or against, uh, that doesn't have, that, that's done as an intellectual exercise rather than paid testimony for either the prosecution or defense. Um, but it'd be yeah, existing, uh, you know, expanding that sort of model of um, enlarging the conversation with experts who are qualified. It's an interesting psychological conjecture, right? That denial, that if you ask an economist on the street and say, hey, are you captured? I think their initial response would be, no, of course not. Look, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a rational, free-thinking person. Um, he, he thinks, though, that they're probably rational enough that you call this to their attention, and they get more of a sense uh, of the ways and ways in which these influences might work. That might, that might actually, that, even that self-awareness could help them police and monitor their own behavior. And so as you say, it's a very optimistic view that uh, human psychology, if this brought, is brought to their attention, they can actually have the capacity to monitor that um, and self-monitor that. Uh, but yeah, he's, he's optimistic about that. And you might think in other domains how optimistic simply educating people about these things in itself might be. Uh, okay, well, this is good. So I wanted to leave the last few minutes uh, today to, to think about the final project. We're about to go on spring break. And um, the, a number of things I want to say, both about its format, uh, how we build up to it, uh, what, we're asking, what we're asking for you substantially, as well as some of the technical requirements. So again, the idea is for you to go out there in the world and, and identify something that you think is a kind of case of institutional corruption. Some institution that's not fulfilling its purpose for reasons that you think you can diagnose, understand, and analyze, and in light of that, suggest some positive remedies, some proposals for reform, uh, some way in which something could be different. So it has all these components of identifying, analyzing, um, and then responding to. <clears throat> and the format can be a conventional paper, so you can write a 10 to 12 page paper if you like. Um, but we're also giving this option, uh, which we think has a variety of virtues and benefits, of putting together a short video. The video can be up to five minutes long. And the video is a way for you to lay out in a way that's accessible and understandable to a wide audience what exactly the problem is, work us through how it works, uh, give us the analysis, lay it out there, and show us your proposal and its merits. Um, <clears throat> five minutes, it turns out, and I should add, you can work, if you like, with one other person, uh, but they have to be in your section. If, that's a, if there's somebody you desperately want to work with who's not your section, come talk to us. There's a lot of reasons organizationally why this is probably going to work, uh, why this is important, but, um, but we can discuss that. Um, <clears throat> so this is the, these are the official requirements. Let's talk a little bit more about what this might look like. So there's been, for the last three years, a handful of other professors that have done something similar. And let me give you one example. This is sort of totally off topic for us. The term persistent vegetative state was coined in the British medical journal The Lancet in April 1972. <coughs> but 133 years earlier, you would have found the same phrase in the same journal, not about comas as much as elementary schools. In his lecture on the moral education of children, Dr. Felix Voisin told his colleagues to be very careful when teaching children born of insane parents. No matter how smart or well-adjusted they may seem, these children are liable at any time without any apparent external cause to be struck insane. But there is one way, Voisin told the crowd, that you can snatch them from the kind of fatality that hangs over them. The solution? Keep their feet warm and their heads cool. Gymnastic exercise. In short, Voisin writes, keep them in a vegetative state. For 19th century educators, the vegetative state wasn't being inert as we think of it today, just the opposite. At about the same time, the American Annals of Education quoted one Dr. Brigham on the maxims of physical education. During childhood as well as in infancy, Brigham writes, the regulation of vegetative functions ought to be the most important point of education. On the contrary, he writes, too many children are shut up forced to sit quiet and to breathe a confined air. But even though 
the terminology is different. This 19th century complaint seems like one that children today hear as well. You don't go out and play enough. You just sit around playing video games or watching TV like a couch potato. A strange phrase, couch potato. It's a pun. See, when television first came out, educators thought it would be like a tiny Ivy League school in every home. But by the 1960s, viewers had other ideas entirely. They started calling the TV the idiot box or the boob tube. Someone who watched the boob tube all day was a boob tuber. Get it? Tuber? It works even better because potatoes have eyes. And because the food most associated with vegging out is the potato chip. So why is it we call people vegetables or plants? Is it because we look similar? Because we grow? Because we eat them in certain situations? Does it have to do with consciousness? Even a term as seemingly specific as vegetative state changes its meaning, even contradicts itself based on who you ask and when. But these changes, like most historical changes, are gradual ones. They creep like a vine. And no one can ever really predict in what direction. Okay, so that's a video done by a student. Uh, the duration was 2 minutes and 47 seconds. So again, enormous amount communicated in 2 minutes and 47 seconds. Um, our guidelines for our videos is, we, because these projects can be pretty large, and there's a lot of information you want to communicate, we're going to allow you up to 5 minutes, which is actually, it sounds very short, but it's actually a significant amount of time. Um, so you have, you have that canvas to paint with. And <clears throat> I don't know if, 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 this isn't the, if this is the first time you've done a project like this and you choose to do uh, <clears throat> the multimedia video option. Um, so we'd like to assist you in various ways uh, to make sure that this is something that the technical impediments don't actually uh, prevent you from making the intellectual points. Um, so we just say it's a five minute uh, maximum video length. Um, we're going to have them due Tuesday, the 29th of April. That's uh, the very final week of class. And because it's a large class, what we're, what we're going to do is show up to class on Tuesday, and we're going to randomly choose people to have their videos screened. So you all get to see a sampling of what your colleagues are doing. So that Tuesday and Thursday, we'll do some video screenings as well as in some of the final uh, sections that week. Um, and depending on what sort of last minute uh, technical difficulties are encountered, uh, there, there might be opportunities to, uh, uh, to refine anything that goes terribly wrong technologically. Um, <clears throat> what we're uh, asking you to do in preparation, so you have all of this spring break, uh, you have a week after you come back, uh, we're going through more case studies, and you should be thinking about this final project. And by Thursday, April 3rd, We'd like you to give a, a paragraph that outlines the idea you want to investigate, what your thought is, um, as well as a visual aid that you want to upload on, on iSight's Dropbox. And something to be considering from the get-go is not only your analysis, but how you want to communicate. How do you, want, how do you make this visual medium work for your benefit? Uh, Professor Lessig is a great example of how to use visual aids, making them work for your benefit. You've had some uh, first-hand examples of that this semester. And you should be thinking very much in how you want to communicate this and how you can make that come to life through various sorts of imagery. Uh, we will be working with uh, a few of the institutes on campus that are set up to assist uh, on various sorts of technological projects. There's a media lab in the Lamont Library. Uh, we're trying to schedule two sorts of um, completely optional, uh, basically, uh, evening tutorials that you can come to. One that helps orient you uh, on some of the technical aspects of software. Uh, one that thinks more about the, um, the dynamics of visual presentation. So those will be options to you. There are a number of free software products that we think are very intuitive, easy to use, um, and pretty powerful. They can help with video editing. Uh, you're certainly welcome to do this on your you know, things on a smartphone, narrated PowerPoint, uh, you, Prezi, or any other presentation software. You, know, you can write literally have sketches on a piece of paper, take a few subsequent photos of those. There's a lot of very low cost um, and rather low tech demand uh, ways that you can approach this project. Uh, but it's something that you really need to be thinking about for a while, both to get the, uh, the actual analytic narrative laid out as well as the visual communication strategy laid out. 
we think this will pay big dividends, that this is something that you'll be able to share with a lot of colleagues that will actually be much more watched, much more um, engaged with than a standard paper that you just turn in and get turned back to you and it's you and your TF and the uh, professors of the course that ever see it. Um, so we think it actually has this larger benefit, uh, both for the course and educating each other as well as for a number of other people that come after you. Um, any questions at this point about the, 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 the actual assignment itself, its components, what we're asking of you? Yes, so the second paper uh, is April 8th, uh, and that, so we've been, we've been ironing out all these details the last uh, week or so, and these will both be posted in extraordinary detail on iSites in the next 48 hours. Um, so you'll have, everything will actually be available there, all the details for you to refer back to. Um, at first glance, how many of you want to do the video versus the paper? So everybody who's thinking of doing a kind of video project? Okay, oh yeah, wow, great, okay. Um, so. Uh, <coughs> Over spring break, think about, think about your case and think about how you want to visually communicate that. Um, you have the first due date, uh, April 3rd. We just want a short little, either, you know, short little visual and paragraph. Uh, you have April 8th, that second paper, which is an analysis of a case done in class uh, that you're proposing some sort of solution to. And the final project is encompassing sort of the entire gamut of this course, identifying a case, analyzing it, with the solution, presenting in a way that others can understand. Um, and I should finally just add, because I don't know if I, I was on here, but I didn't call attention to it, uh, accompanying that video <coughs> is a short statement. So you, you have an opportunity. There's going to be some complexities that you can't perfectly communicate in a visual media uh, with narration. And so we're asking for an 800-word commentary that explains the more nuanced parts of it, that allows you to evaluate um, you know, the pluses and minuses, perhaps, of your proposed remedy. Uh, things that can't, you can't get across but are important to the story. So that is the format. Uh, we hope it will be exciting, rewarding, intellectually uh, interesting. Um, I don't want to underestimate, though, no, the amount of work that goes into crafting a five-minute video. So please start thinking about it early. We're going to make sure you have a lot of the technical resources needed. Um, the most important thing is the intellectual substance of the final presentation. But if you're able to think about the technical side early, too, that's going to really benefit you. So. Unless there are any other questions, that's it for today. Enjoy spring break. Oh, wait, one final thing. Extremely important. This afternoon, in the next hour, for a variety of reasons, we need to give out a mid-semester survey. And this is, it's not a psychological trick thing. This is actually for real. Um, and this is your opportunity. It's a genuine opportunity to help us uh, in the second half of the course think about how we, uh, uh, what we're doing well, what needs improvement. And also for the people in Gen Ed overseeing this, it's extremely, extremely valuable for us to have a high response rate for this. So please take a few minutes, uh, fill it out. You'll get that out this afternoon. And then you can go on and have a fun break. Okay. That's good. Huh? I wouldn't lie to them. No.